Ancient Greece was a land of peculiar customs and practices. It was not uncommon for individuals to embark on journeys to the mountains in search of divine knowledge, or for women to inhale volcanic vapors to gain insights into the future. Drinking games were also a popular pastime, with participants enthusiastically throwing wine around the rooms. Additionally, it was customary for women to dress as men during wedding ceremonies, adding an unconventional touch to the celebration. Ancient Greek theaters were known for their unique performances, with participants wearing masks and even facing the possibility of being struck with sticks if their behavior was deemed inappropriate. Before we begin, subscribe and turn on the notification bell to receive new episodes. Number one, the Thesmophoria Festival. In ancient Greece, men enjoyed great freedom within the context of the Thesmophoria. Unfortunately, women were excluded from citizenship and forbidden from participating as actresses. Instead, male actors took on the roles of female characters in plays. However, women had their own form of liberation and expression at the Thesmophoria Festival. This three-day celebration was exclusively open to married women who had undergone specific initiation rituals. The festival revolved around the captivating myth of Persephone's abduction by Hades and the subsequent grief experienced by her mother, Demeter. Throughout the festival, women practiced fasting, and various rituals that mirrored the narrative. They reverently placed sacred items and offerings in underground chambers to symbolize Persephone's descent into the underworld. Additionally, they sacrificed several piglets, burying them underground. Pigs had significance related to the goddess Demeter, associated with fertility and agriculture. It was believed that the well-being of Demeter and the success of the harvest were ensured through this act. Furthermore, one of the festival days was dedicated to sharing obscene jokes, an element known as ritual obscenity. It seems that Demeter took great pleasure in sharing spicy jokes, making them one of her preferred forms of entertainment. For this, I have compiled a selection of jokes that might have been exchanged at that time. Imagine a gathering of women relaxing and exchanging humorous anecdotes, similar to how men would gather at a symposium, engaging in lively conversation, and enjoying their wine in a fun manner. Number two, the renowned Oracle of Delphi. In 36 BC, Alexander the Great embarked on a journey to a secluded temple located on the slopes of Mount Parnassus. His goal was to seek guidance from the Oracle of Apollo at Delphi, seeking validation for his grand ambitions of conquering the world. However, his encounter with the priestess Epithea left him disheartened. She refused to give him any answer, regarding his potential title as ruler of the world, urging him to return later due to her busy and irritated state. Frustrated by this response, Alexander forcibly grabbed her by the hair. It was at this moment that she exclaimed, You are invincible, my son, prompting him to release her. Alexander the Great, though perhaps impatient, was not the only one to make the journey from Athens in search of his destined future. From King Leonidas of Sparta to Socrates, Influential figures of ancient Greece were drawn to the Oracle of Delphi, eager to hear the prophetic words of the priestess. These oracles and prophecies had a significant impact on political alliances and military campaigns, even guiding decisions related to the establishment of new colonies. The influence of this temple and its priestesses on Greek history cannot be overstated. It is worth noting that these priestesses were constantly under the influence of mind-altering substances. In the depths of the temple's inner sanctuary, there were chambers filled with natural gas and an eternal flame that had been burning for countless years. Whenever a weary traveler sought guidance or advice, they would ask a single question to the Pythia. This revered figure would then retreat to the inner sanctuary, sitting on Apollo's tripod, a three-legged stool positioned over a fissure in the rock that emitted intoxicating gas. It was said that these vapors induced hallucinations and a trance-like state. After receiving her vision, the Pythia would return and deliver the answer to the traveler. It is intriguing to consider the fees charged by the Pythia for her services. The notion that a woman in a cave inhaling vapors played such a fundamental role in shaping Greek history is truly remarkable. However, it is still unclear whether she also offered freshly baked cookies to her guests, akin to the Matrix Oracle. 
Although, given her altered state, it is safe to assume she was likely preoccupied with other matters. Number three, the Katabo's drinking game. Who doesn't enjoy a fun drinking game? What are your personal favorites? In ancient Greece, drinking often accompanied philosophical discussions. The Greek symposium was a respected tradition where intellectual elites gathered, indulging in alcohol, and engaging in lively conversations about the nature of the universe. It's no wonder that college fraternities adopted Greek letters, perhaps inspired by this rich tradition. Typically held at someone's home, these symposiums took place in a designated space known as the Andron, similar to a human cave of ancient Greece. Guests reclined on U-shaped couches, resting their left arms on cushions to free their right arms for eating, drinking, and playing games. Wine played a central role in these gatherings, often diluted with water and served in special vessels called craters, akin to large bowls which were stirred by a slave before being consumed in a cup known as a kylix. As the night progressed and guests became more relaxed, discussions delved into more complex topics, from poetry and literature to politics and philosophy. After all, no party is complete without a touch of fun, at symposiums, there was plenty of music and dancing, accompanied by generous amounts of wine. As the evening wore on, a game called Kotobos would begin, captivating the participants. This game, like any drinking game, had simple rules. After drinking the wine in their kylix, participants would throw the remaining dregs at a designated target in the center of the room. The Greeks used specially designed cups, known as kytex, made specifically for this purpose. These cups had elongated handles and wide, shallow bowls, making it easier to toss the wine dregs. The target was often an image or object suspended from the ceiling or floating in a basin. Occasionally, the game involved aiming at a specific section of the target, and the participant who hit most accurately would be declared the winner. However, the rewards for winners were not in the form of a newly acquired servant or the authority to choose the play to be performed in the nearby amphitheater. In fact, there were no tangible prizes. Instead, the outcome of participating was usually a throbbing headache and feelings of regret the next morning. Number four, Spartan weddings. In contrast to today's extravagant and costly weddings, Spartan weddings were characterized by simplicity and a touch of peculiarity. Spartan brides began their wedding day by immediately shaving their heads, symbolizing the transition from maidenhood to marriage. This act of shaving was seen as a representation of Spartan values of simplicity and practicality. The bride would then dress in male clothing and sandals. She would then retire to her room in her parents' house, extinguish the lights, and lie down on a mat or bed in the dark, awaiting the arrival of the groom. The aim of this wait was for the groom to stealthily enter and consummate the marriage before departing immediately. Alternatively, some sources suggest that the groom would steal the bride consummate the marriage at her place, and then return her home. Throughout the day, the couple was prohibited from seeing each other until the bride became pregnant, which signified the official recognition of the union. The unique nature of Spartan weddings can be attributed to several factors. Spartan society emphasized discipline and militarism, resulting in a more austere approach to weddings. Unlike other Greek cities where dowries were customary, Spartan weddings did not involve the exchange of gifts or money from the bride's family to the groom's family. Furthermore, Spartan wedding ceremonies did not incorporate religious rituals or invoke the blessings of the gods, as Spartans showed interest in religion only in relation to marriage. Men residing in military barracks discreetly visited the bride's family home for intimate moments. It seems the Spartans prioritized allocating their resources to military equipment rather than to extravagant and costly wedding celebrations. Number five, the Greek spectacle. During ancient Greece, attending the theater was considered a civic duty for Athenian citizens. The city even subsidized tickets for those who could not afford them, ensuring that everyone had the opportunity to watch a comedy or tragedy. The Greeks saw theater as a means to educate the masses, conveying political and moral lessons. The narratives and structures used in their performances laid the groundwork for literature and cinema, including today's popular Marvel action movies. In ancient Greece, amphitheaters were the primary venues for theatrical productions. These architectural marvels were carved into hillsides and had a semicircular shape.
Their design was carefully sloped to amplify sound, creating a natural megaphone effect that allowed even the most distant spectators to hear the actors clearly. At the beginning of the play, a chorus of 15 to 25 people adorned the stage with elaborate costumes. They set the scene, established the mood, provided basic information, introduced the characters, and offered details about the events leading up to the plot. Engaging in a variety of expressive activities, the ancient Greeks sang, danced, and recited choral odes known for their profound reflections on the unfolding drama or comedy, offering valuable moral and philosophical insights. These comments were highly appreciated by the Greek audience. After the chorus's performance, the actors made their entrance. In ancient Greek theater, actors wore masks of peculiar shapes. For comedic performances, the masks were extravagant and eccentric, while in tragic plays they had a darker appearance with features reminiscent of a suffering face. As seen in the Katabos drinking game, the Greeks had a penchant for competition, and theater was no exception. Every spring in Athens, the Dionysian festival took place, dedicated to Dionysus, the god of wine and fertility. At the heart of this festival was a theatrical competition. A panel of judges, selected by the people in a somewhat arbitrary manner, assessed the performances. The most talented playwrights, directors, actors, and set designers were honored with crowns. This event was similar to the Oscars, but took place in real time. Winning such accolades was a tremendous achievement. The most renowned playwrights of the time, including Sophocles, Euripides, Aeschylus, and Aristophanes, underwent a rigorous process to bring their plays to life. It all started with the task of writing the plays themselves, an obvious requirement. After completing their works, playwrights submitted them to an Athenian public official who carefully selected the best plays and allocated funds for their production. In addition to writing the scripts, playwrights were responsible for composing the music and choreographing the intricate dance performances that adorn their plays. To ensure the grandeur of the theatrical experience, they received additional financial support for scenery, costumes, and rehearsal space. Notably, playwrights also compensated the actors and the chorus for their contributions. Aristophanes had a propensity for satirizing politicians and influential figures, often resulting in physical confrontations with them. A notable target of Aristophanes' mockery was Cleon, a prominent Athenian politician known for his provocative and manipulative tactics. In his comedic play, The Knights, Aristophanes portrayed Cleon as a corrupt and greedy sausage seller, tarnishing his reputation. This portrayal infuriated Cleon, leading him to sue Aristophanes for defamation. However, instead of apologizing, Aristophanes responded with another play titled The Wasps, which directly mocked Cleon's tendency to sue others. The protagonist of this play, Pavloklan, derived his name from a type of unpleasant cooked ham, further solidifying Cleon's negative image. Once again, this portrayal was not a good omen for Cleon. Number six, the offering of food. Celebrating and feasting were beloved pastimes of the ancient Greeks who indulged in wine and grapes. However, there were certain foods and drinks they vehemently avoided. Among these was milk, which was considered inappropriate for adults and associated with barbarism, being acceptable only for babies. Additionally, the consumption of meat from domesticated animals like cows and sheep was frowned upon. Those who regularly consumed this meat were seen as low-status peasants, although it was considered suitable for religious offerings to the gods. During festivals and ceremonies, a portion of this meat was offered to the gods after undergoing a purification ritual. Eating meat was accompanied by various rituals. The selection of the sacrificial animal was based on its age and health, as it was essential not to offer a sick bull to the gods. The animal would then be taken to an altar, where an official would recite prayers to the deity worship that day. Finally, the animal would be sacrificed with a quick and precise cut to the throat. The ancient Greeks had a ritualistic practice of collecting the blood of sacrificed animals and spreading it on the altar. The organs, especially the liver, were carefully examined to discern any omens indicating the god's approval or disapproval of the sacrifice. After purification and sacrifice, the meat could be shared among the participants and worshipers. If you find this practice disturbing, you are not alone. Pythagoras and many other ancient Greeks shared this opinion. Number seven, the transmigration of souls. 
The concept of the transmigration of souls adopted by Pythagoras and his disciples posited that the soul transitions from one body to another after death, with no limitations on who could inhabit. In the context of this belief system, if someone were to return as a pig, there was a high probability that they would be offered as a sacrifice to Demeter during the aforementioned festivities. Pythagoras viewed animals as sentient beings with souls similar to humans. Therefore, taking the life of an animal for sustenance was seen as equivalent to taking the life of another human being. Pythagoras, the founder of the philosophical and religious movement known as Pythagoreanism, incorporated his dietary principles into a broader philosophy that placed great emphasis on virtues such as self-control and moderation. It is important to note that he had an aversion to beans, as it was believed they housed the souls of the deceased and were considered difficult to digest. Number 8. The Food Fight Legend has it that the audience's laughter during Aristophanes' plays was so intense that it caused interruptions to the actors and chorus on stage. However, things could get even worse. Greek theatergoers were not shy about expressing their discontent with a play by booing, whistling, or even throwing vegetables, stones, or any other objects they had on hand. This leads us to wonder, who brings vegetables to a play? Were they planning to make a salad in the amphitheater? Of course, eating in the amphitheater was strictly prohibited. Thanks for tuning in. We'd love to hear about any other peculiar traditions you'd like to learn about. Feel free to share in the comments and don't forget to show your support by liking and subscribing for more fascinating historical facts.